Hello and welcome to Bias Exam Prep IS. As part of your comprehensive news analysis, today we'll be discussing seven important articles out of the Hindu newspaper, Delhi edition. Good morning to all of you. Let's look at the topics we will cover. Before that, remember to subscribe to our channel for Telegram and YouTube. It will help you in your preparation generally. First, we'll discuss an interesting act which is in the news, which is Digital India Act and how it tries to replace the IT Act itself. After Sikkim and the floods explained, there was an article explaining why it happened. We have discussed this in a little bit of detail, but this time we'll do it properly. Last but not the least, there was the Asiatic wild dog which was in the news. So species in news is very, very important because that gives you fodder for the examination. Thereafter, in the prelims by its section, we'll discuss four very standard but very straightforward topics. First, the new ensign of the Indian Air Force. Very interesting, moving on from the colonial understanding itself. Thereafter, how Aditya L1 is moving towards is Larange Point and the last maneuver in that regard has been done. Last but not the least, something new for the students or the children in schools, which is that they can give board exams twice. The logic behind it we will discuss. And last but not the least, a ferry service between Sri Lanka and India. And that will be very interesting for the foreign policy and the international relations between these two countries. With this, let's start our first topic. And as always, I'll give you the basics of the topic first. And thereafter, we'll talk about the nitty gritty and then we'll revise in the same session itself. So, the first is the Digital India Act 2023 which is the news which has now been pushed towards the public for their opinion, for the stakeholders to understand. And let's try, try to understand what is the point of it. So, the Digital India Act, the DIA Act 2023, the main purpose of it is to basically bring in a law which stays with the current situation when it comes to the Digital India landscape or even internet use in India. The original act which is the IT Act 2000, it was introduced when internet was in its nascent stage, when it was in its infancy and therefore what happened was that the provisions of the act reflect that which is from, from 5.5 million users in 2000, we are at 850 million users today. And therefore, there are multiple things which have emerged between 2000 and 2023. In these 23 years, new vulnerabilities, cyber, cyber issues, cyber hacking, cyber crime, cyber security, generally trolling, hate crime, and even hate speech, what we call as post-truth, fake news, everything has now started to circulate on the internet. And therefore, internet needs regulation. But from a new perspective itself and therefore the Digital India Act tries to do that which is to introduce a new aspect to how we go about regulating the internet in that regard. So the first is the law which we have is becoming redundant, obsolete to some level and therefore the new act should embody the Digital India which we know today. So this is the reason why we are introducing this act. Now there are four major provisions. And there are two major issues. So, out of these four come out two issues. So, let's first discuss the four major provisions which will be introduced through this act. The nitty-gritty of the act we will know as we go towards the passing of it or its introduction in the parliament itself. But we right now know that four principles are at work at this point of time. So, the four major points or provisions or principles. The first one is online safety and trust, wherein the citizens' rights should not be jeopardized. Should not be jeopardized. It needs to be safeguarded. So you keep the citizen's fundamental rights, his basic rights, his constitutional rights, safeguarded through the new regime in which online safety and trust is very important. And herein comes the concept that we have to have governmental intervention because there are in multiple ways in which we are vulnerable on the internet. And we can't leave it to multi, what we call as multinational corporations, to Google, to Amazon and to Facebook, to Meta, that they regulate our presence online. This is the first thing. Second is called accessibility which is very important for India, which is 
open internet that there needs to be accessibility to everyone KYC needs to be done for everybody who is involved as a stakeholder and also the people who are involved as intermediaries but open internet is something which is very important that we all should have equal access to the internet and its information thereafter third and here are coming here comes the two very interesting provisions and the pro problematic ones also is that it wants to guide emerging technologies and here comes the issue wherein it wants to guide guide ai which is artificial intelligence machine learning and blockchain as examples these are what we call as emerging technologies and what the act wants to do is is to regulate these new emerging technologies and also guide them now how do you guide something is governmental regulation fourth is the most interesting one and is going to not going to go very well with the stakeholders is to review the concept of safe harbor principle the concept of safe harbor principle what do i mean by safe harbor see under safe harbor principle what happens is that for example for example i am on facebook i am on meta i am on instagram snapchat whatever it may be and i start to write seditious content hate speech or any form of content which is user generated but is going against the policy of the company also and is against the law also so under safe harbor principle what happens is the accountability the liability of the company of the digital intermediary is zero when it comes to user generated content wherein facebook is not responsible for what i am writing so if i am writing hate speech on facebook or on meta or on snapchat or on instagram or on x which is twitter if i am doing that i am liable for it accountability is on solved on so with but the intermediary has no accountability so therefore either it is the user or it is the end consumer or the what we call as the person who is reading it but the intermediary has no liability this is called where do you keep accountability accountability is on the user so what we see is user generated data or content the company the digital intermediary is not liable or accountable for what it is and now india wants to review this policy of safe harbor which is that should it be like this that x meta be it snapchat be it instagram they become reddit they become the hub of all this information they say it is not our problem we are just an intermediary we are giving you a platform it is a user who is the problem now this raises a question which is that should the intermediary be liable accountable or not and india wants to review this question once again now these are the four basic provisions of this act first is something which we are talking about quite a lot which is safety online accountability citizens rights should not be in a way infringed or in a way should always be safeguarded by the government second is accessibility to all again very important inclusiveness now come the two problematic ones guide the technologies and thereafter review safe harbor principle now if we understand the basic provisions i'll talk about the issues and then we can come back again to the provisions see the two major issues two major issues prima facie as we can see right now in this act is that first if you are guiding emerging technologies then it can do two things first either it can foster ai machine learning or what we call as blockchain but in most probability the biggest probability is 
is that once the government gets involved, it will do two things. Either control it too much or the entrepreneurship, the enterprises, the market-based capitalistic, what we call as impulse, which would accelerate its development, which would make it better and better every day, would not be there. What it means is that if the government starts to guide AI, machine learning and blockchain, it will lead to stifled development or slowdown in its course of development. Because if a private company does this, it will keep on doing research and development in order to get more and more profit. And therefore it is, for example, ChatGPT, every month we see a new development with regards to that. However, the government, as soon as it gets its end clear or it gets its goals completed, research and development in this area will stop. And more than that, a legal framework would also limit its development because there's no end and there is no limit to AI or machine learning or blockchain. Though Elon Musk and a lot of people are talking about regulating AI, blockchain and machine learning should not be regulated because they are based on better and better efficiency and performance of uh, AI and generally a computer software. So this can have both positive or negative impact, but we believe that it will most probably stifle development and slow down the process. Now comes the second major issue. Second issue is that if we are reviewing the safe harbor principle, now today, if I say to Meta, if I say to Google, or if I say to Instagram or to X, that, okay, you are also liable for what the user is generating, which is that user generated content, the accountability and the concept of liability, if it is applied to the intermediary also, do you really think that these intermediaries would allow free speech or even allow basic content to go through? Because what they will start to do is they will start to censor. They will check if it is pro-government or it is criticizing the government. And what is the mandate which tells you that what, what information is good or bad? Now, the point is this again can be both positive and negative, which is that Yes, there's a need to make these intermediaries liable because they sit there and spread hate across the countries, across the world itself. But also, if we start to make them liable for things, then they will start to stop publishing content, which may be about, for example, a corrupt government in Sudan. And the Sudanese government would say to X that we, you would be liable to be prosecuted for something like that. And then X or Twitter or what we call as Telegram, any digital intermediary would then take down that content. So it's a slippery slope. It can be both good for a country and a user, but could be bad for free speech. So in a way, in a way, this also creates a question that whilst we are trying to keep our citizens' rights safeguarded, but would, a, would it be making the intermediary liable a problem in the way we safeguard the rights itself? So now these two fundamental questions have emerged. So this article is about telling you two things. First, it is telling you the four major provisions. And second, it is telling you the two major problems. So the four major provisions, again, I'm repeating myself, is online safety and trust will go through the PPT also. Thereafter, accessibility, which is open internet, that is not a problem. Guide emerging technologies, which is problematic because then government stops any form of innovation after a certain point if the means have already met its end. And last but not the least is that safe harbor principle is under review. This could do two things. It could also create a very good regime, but at the same point of time, it could also lead to a point where the free speech, free content, content which is important for our public opinion to be formed may be taken back or may be withheld. This is the problematic aspect here. So there are two things, two issues, four points. Let's read them out of the PPT, but I hope that you understand it generally. So 
why was the DIA Act or Digital India Act was introduced? Because it wants to be in sync with the digital revolution we are going through in the 21st century. The IT Act was introduced at a time when basically the internet was in its nascent stage. And with rapid technological development, user behavior changing, and from 5.5 million users at one point of time to 850 million users today, there's a need for a new regime. And therefore, the internet has evolved. We need to also evolve our act with new types of vulnerabilities also emerging. We need a better act. And therefore, DIA recognizes that and wants a legal framework to address them. Now, what are the key provisions of this act? First is online safety and trust, which is that we want to safeguard the interest and the citizens rights in the digital realm. And therefore, there needs to be a international legal principle at which everybody is at sync and everybody is protected. This is not the problem one. Thereafter, this is the problematic aspect. Recognize growing importance of new age technologies such as AI blockchain and provide guidelines for its utilization and its development in that regard. So while it wants ethical AI practices, blockchain applications and new forms of accountability, the point of the matter is if you will start to guide the development, guide the utilization of something like this, it will create a hindrance in the natural evolution of these technologies which would happen under the impulse of a free or what we call as market-based system. Thereafter, it upholds and that is not a problem the concept of open internet balance between accessibility and regulations KYC for everybody who gives wearable devices and anybody who is liable for criminal prosecution and last but not the least this is the second major major problem which is it wants to review the safe harbor principle which presently shields online platforms from liability related to user generated content indicating a potential shift in online accountability standards and this is something dangerous and therefore two major issues emerge first is it stifles entrepreneurial in incentive and foreign investment when it comes to emerging technologies at the same point of time the reviewing of the safe harbor principle is most probably going to take away freedom of expression so this is again a developing story We'll see how it goes forward, how it generally is going to impact us. But what you have to remember here is very straightforward three things, which is first the need. The need is because of the fact that digital India is changing. Internet is evolving. Act needs to involve, which is from IT Act. We need to move towards the DIA Act. Second is provisions. In the provisions, four major provisions, the key words here are going to be open internet, safe and or what we call a safe internet and trust which is basically you need to be safeguarded in the internet realm. Thereafter safe harbor principle review and last but not the least guide emerging technologies and out of this only we get the two problems which is this can lead to freedom of speech issues and this can lead to foreign investment or entrepreneurial issues when it comes to the development and evolution of these technologies and therefore therefore it's a needed initiative but these two issues needed to be or needs to be resolved before anything goes forward. Straightforward concept. As we know and as you would know, we will get more and more articles. This was text and context. We will get editorials about it. We will get to know more and more details as we go forward and we'll keep on adding to these four things. So I hope that this act is clear. Now you have one more act to worry about in the examination. And because these are related to the internet, very important in today's context. First, article done. Three basic things, need, provisions and issues. We've discussed that. Now let's move to the second article, 
which is Sikkim and why did the glacial lake outburst flood happen? Now, I've discussed this previously with you. Some images may be the same, but the explanation or why did it happen, we have new insights now. We know that on 4th October, there was a flash flood in the Tista and that in turn led to the, what you call the, the Tista 3 dam or the Changtung dam to be destroyed and the whole hydrological system and the hydroelectricity, what we call our infrastructure, all of it being destroyed. 23 army personnel were lost and over and above that now the death toll is rising as we go, as we get to know about the impact as the things are becoming more and more clear in Sikkim. Now, what is this basic concept? This is a static issue. I've discussed this with you previously also. It's called a glacier, a glacial lake outburst flood. And as I told you that when a glacier for example, starts to melt, starts to melt. I'm again discussing the basic static with you. When it starts to melt because of maybe natural factors or be climate change, be global warming, it starts to develop a certain type of lake on its mouth. And these lakes are basically bound by what are called moraines. Moraines, as it says here, moraine is a natural dam. It develops because of rock, sediment and debris. So what happens is that whilst this glacier is moving and this is called glacial erosion, the glacial erosion along with the lake formation leads to sediment rocks coming through and these rocks start to basically bind the lake in a certain place. But it is based on the fact that once the capacity of that moraine or is, is breached or the lake becomes too big for that moraine, the moraine can be breached very quickly and very easily. Just to show you a moraine, this is the Lonak Lake which is in question and this is the moraine, this is the whole moraine sector of the Lonak Lake. If you look at the images which we've already seen also, between 1990 and 2019, there has been an accelerated, what we call as melting of this glacier and the lake has been expanding very quickly and the lateral moraine which is the side moraines and you can see how rock and silt develops and the frontal moraine there is a lateral moraine and the frontal moraine these were more or less stable before 4th October so something happened on 4th October which in turn led to the breaching of the moraine in that regard so there are three things which we need to understand First is glacial lake. Glacial lakes, very easy. When a glacier starts to melt, it in turn leads to lake formation. Multiple rivers can also, when a moraine leads to a certain stream to go down, that can also lead to what we call as river formation. So what we call as perennial glacial rivers are based on this only, which is the lake starts to then overflow as a, as a river. Now, the glacier does erosional activities both laterally and therefore also in the bottom and that leads to moraine formation. Moraine, think of it as a natural dam. Now, very simply, very simply, the melting of the Lonak Lake was accelerated. We have seen ISRO and other scientists also talking about it, that this was a disaster in happening. Now, to give you a little bit more insight into it, we know that this South Lonak Glacier is located in Northern Sikkim sector and was the fastest retreating glacier. It has receded nearly 2 kilometers in 46 years and further retreated by 400 meters in 2008 to 2019. So see, 46 years it took 2 kilometers. But between 2008 and 2019, it has gone 400 meters back, which is accelerated. And therefore, the way this glacier was seen, was seen a disaster in making or happening in that area. So, just to give you again a better understanding, we know that there is a glacier, there is a glacier, this is the glacial, I'm giving you a cross-sectional understanding, this is a glacier, and this glacier is melting into a, is melting into a lake, is melting into a lake, is melting into a lake, we understand that also. So this is the lake which has been formed. Think of it as the Lonark Lake, the Lonark Lake. Now, this rate of melting is based on natural factors and global warming had accelerated it. 
Now this lake in a way is bound by what is called a moraine and that develops because of basic silt and erosional activities. Now what we get to know today and what is the new hypothesis which is coming through is two things. Is two things. See, if you look at this map, you will realize it is a quite a lot of volume of water for a very small area and the glacier was melting very quickly and because the Tista flows from the catchment area of the South Lonak Lake itself, if it overflows of automatically Tista will have a flat flash flood. So we know that the Lonak Lake has an impact on the Tista system. Now there are two ways in which this can happen. So the first reason which was given immediately as soon as this disaster happened and now I'm trying to explain to you glacial lake outburst flood is something which I've discussed with you previously also. 5th October CNA you will see I've discussed this with you. This is called the concept of glacial lake outburst flood that the lake overflowed. Now the question is why and the reason which I gave you that day and was seen as the first reason was a cloud burst. And it was believed that there was a major, major inflow of water because of a cloudburst in the northern Sikkim region and the Lonak Lake thereafter overflowed and therefore became a flash flood in the Tista. However, what the meteorological department in Sikkim is telling us is that yes, there has been rain, but in southern Sikkim sector, northern Sikkim sector, there was not significant rain. And over and above that, they don't have the equipment to check what is happening at the Lonak sector because there are multiple glaciers. They don't have real equipment to check or it is not sustainable to have equipment there to check what is the rainfall in that sector. So there are two things. Yes, a cloud burst happened, but we did not in a way detect it or even also did not get any indications on any monitors or any systems. But the second one is the more interesting one which is coming through. And the second one is that in Nepal on 3rd October, there were multiple minor earthquakes. And what is being believed is that the moraine was breached maybe by the aftershocks or the what we call as after, the, the effects of that earthquake. No immediate impact. But somehow this was already an over swelled lake and with the tectonic activities happening in the Himalayas and in the Nepal sector itself and maybe an aftershock in went in this direction and in turn led to in turn led to breaching of the moraine which in turn led to a flash flood. Now the second one can be tested by checking the seismic activities and this is something now people are exploring. And the scientists are exploring that maybe it was not a cloud burst, but it was actually tectonic activities. It was the earthquakes in Nepal, which in turn led to this. Now, the question remains, and this is what the article is talking about, is that yes, it has more or less destroyed all the different hydrological projects, hydroelectric projects in this sector. There are two questions which come about. First is that Obviously, climate change is real and the Himalayan ecology ecosystem is very fragile. And if it is actually earthquakes, and this question was also raised in the parliament previously in August itself, then this raises a question that should we really touch the Himalayan ecosystem and should we really go for big hydroelectric projects and big projects in this sector because the fragility of this ecosystem has come through. Climate change has accelerated the process of these lakes to swell up, to become bigger and bigger. The moraines which were having, for example, were formed over 50, 60 years are now holding more than what they should. And very, very small seismic activity can also lead to these type of breaches. This is the first question. So should we really develop in these sectors very big projects which can lead to these types of issues? And second question is, we need early warning systems because this could have been predicted because if we are actually looking at all of these different lakes and moraines and these glaciers, we should have or we should have at least told the people of Sikkim that the Tista is going to have a very big flash flood and people were caught off guard in the night. 
this raises the question that do we need to develop and should we develop and do we need to deploy it as soon as possible in the sector? And the question and the answer is yes, because early warning systems is the only way we can stop it. There's no other way you can stop it. These freshwater lakes are now becoming problematic because climate change is accelerating their melting. So first thing we, we discussed was what is a glacial lake? Then we discussed the concept of moraine, the dams, the natural dams which are holding it. Third, we discussed the outburst concept that it can break and can lead to the flooding of rivers or even lead to a river formation itself. But the point is that what is the issue here? There are two major issues or reasons seen through. First was a cloud burst over the lake itself, which in turn led to the spilling over. Or second is the new one which is coming through, which is the seismic activity in Nepal having an impact on these moraines and in turn leading to the breach of moraine itself. Now the last but not the least point is should we touch the Himalayan ecosystem? The answer more or less is no. Because if we are doing it, these are very fragile ecosystems and these are disasters in making and in waiting. And therefore we need to do something about that. And last but not the least is the aspect related to early warning systems. We need early warning systems for these concepts so that we can reduce the impact, at least reduce the people who get impacted. These are four things which we had to discuss in this article. I'll read it out. I'll make you the, give you the basic points. I've given you the static also. I've given you the backstory also. So we know that the speculation is that there was very heavy rainfall in the north sector and that in turn led to the moraine getting collapsed or the collapse of the moraine itself which triggered a flood itself. However, there is no evidence of such heavy rain in that area. But as, as the IMD said that we don't have equipment to check that also. But this is the new thing. This is the more interesting point. This is the more important point. Which is there's a new suggestion that a series of earthquakes in Nepal on October 3rd in the afternoon for which the tremors were also felt in Delhi might have played a role. But it may be both. It may be only one. Doesn't really matter. Raises the question. Both the frequency and the severity of such events are going to increase exponentially in future because climate change is not stopping. The Himalayan ecosystem is the most fragile in the world and any disruption in any way we are managing these resources will be problematic for the people in this area. And therefore, very heavy building, gravity dams, even run of the river dams have now come under question because the Tista whole structure was run of the river. And therefore, very simply, very simply, this raises the question that is it really worth it to touch these ecosystems and create potential disasters for the people who are living in that area. And therefore, the last point is you need to know glacial, lake, outburst, flood, GLOF. Plus you need to know the reasons, be it flash flood or be it the earthquakes. Then you need to know how to mitigate it. It is early warning systems and second is stay away from these ecosystems. Stay away from these ecosystems. We should not have heavy or major restructuring of the landscape itself and we need to monitor and we need to have a system in which we can inform the people that something has happened and whilst we can have it for tsunamis, why not for glacial lake outburst floods because Himachal, the whole Uttarakhand sector, Sikkim, Arunachal, most of Northeast is under, under the vulnerability of these issues. And therefore, we need to make sure that we have early warning systems in which maybe infrastructure can come back, but people won't come back. And that is why in order to make sure that the people in these areas are safe, we need to create a regime. So again, you will see more and more articles about this, but we have a second article on the Sikkim sector and now this gives us the reason. The interesting one is the earthquake one which shows you how seismic activities in the Himalayas can have a cascading effect also in the other areas of that sector. So with this, with this the second article is also done. Now we move to a more factual one. But more important, here again, it's a very interesting hypothesis which they played with. It's a very interesting article, which I'll tell you. So, 
the article talks about the asiatic wild dog commonly also called the dhole dhol whatever you want to call it i'll call it the asiatic wild dog and it is an endangered species iucn endangered red list endangered species very beautiful it's basically a wild dog it's a canine native of central south east and southeast asian uh, sector itself and they have different names for example asiatic wild dog asiatic uh, indian wild dog whistling dog red dog and even mountain wolf they are called but wolves are very different but basic point is very it's basically an early species the wild species of dogs as we see today it's a asiatic wild dog we call it asiatic wild dog canine species it's the problem is that it is now endangered and that is why we are discussing it so they are the only endangered wild pack living which is that together they live in the wild in the tropical indian forest and is considered very high for risk for extinction and that is why endangered it is moving towards critically endangered very soon and we hope that we can arrest it now before i go into the nitty gritties of the article itself it gives you a lot of different things there was a hypothesis which they were checking now this is where you need to listen to me and understand see there are these dogs basically have certain activities which are called the durial activities daily activities which intersect with different other carnivores so for example we have the asiatic wild dog this is one ecosystem this is one ecosystem and we have the asiatic wild dog and thereafter we also have tigers and for example wolves rather they are called wolves themselves leopards now in a way these three are in are competing with each other because when it comes to the food chain these three are competing with each other all are carnivores all eat smaller animals down the food chain and therefore they are what we call as antagonistic when it comes to their daily activities and their interaction so if any population goes up there should be a decrease in the other population or if they are in the same sector in the same ecosystem there should be a negative impact on one of them this seems to be logical and this is the hypothesis with which this study went through which is that is there a negative correlation between what we call as habitat interportability interaction and habitat coexistence of two carnivores to give you the exact terminology to give you the exact terminology the concept of habitat exclusivity hypothesis or the concept of prey availability habitat suitability and that is something the concept they believed that if we mutually create exclusive zones for them we are better off we are better off that if there is a certain section for the leopards they will survive in themselves certain section for the tigers they will survive in themselves certain section for the wild dogs they will survive in themselves this is called habitat exclusivity concept that they are exclusive to each other however what the study saw and this is the most interesting point what the study saw was that when we are leading to habitat exclusivity the population is starting to go down for each one of them on the other hand if they exist if they exist together if they exist together which is their coexistence together in a certain way that in turn is leading to better impact on all of them which tells you that ecological dynamics are beyond logic sometimes and are more nuanced and complex which means that if tigers and wild dogs are living together in the same ecosystem they are sustaining better the prey hunting and food availability concept is also better and they are peacefully coexisting also as a more symbiotic relationship rather if we are creating exclusive zones for them there's more chance for extinction this is why this article becomes interesting because it shows a positive correlation in prey availability and suitability 
when it comes to two carnivores being there together this is very interesting because this allows us now to understand that if there's a national park if there's a national park or if there is a wildlife sanctuary we should not go for total habitat exclusivity because that is leading to more issues than actually solving the problem and this study proves to us that the coexistence of them together where there is internal competition where there is interaction where there is intersection they interact in a better way and that leads to the prey availability and the habitat suitability to go up a little bit technical but very interesting so let me read it out to you and you will understand it better so we understand that it is a endangered species we understand it it is forest based it the only wild pack animal in the indian tropical forest itself the reasons why it is going towards extinction is habitat loss standard for all animals declining prey availability this is the question prey availability means what they can eat is available less persecution by human and dog interaction disease and interspecific competition these were the two questions which they went with that because if it is for example preys are less and there is more competition maybe that is why they are becoming extinct now iucn says that between 1000 to 2000 are there in this whole sector classified endangered now what this study talks about is that overlapping now pay, pay attention overlapping prey availability which is that the animals eat the same thing or habitat suitability which is suitable for the existence of that animal could dictate a positive association between the wild dogs and the tigers facilitating coexistence and e coexistence and existence and even cooperative behavior between the two species of carnivores this is the interesting thing when there are wild dogs with a tiger the tiger is also having better suitability wild dogs are also having better suitability but when they are mutually exclusive to each other they are seeing decline in the suitability of that habitat itself and this is the most interesting point as as an animal in its dural dural which is daily activities the wild dogs have highest temporal overlap which is when it comes to overlap time wise and prey wise with leopards and lowest with clouded leopards and they have also have high overlap with tigers also and they live in pack of 5 to 10 largest could larger groups could be at as big as 30 but the point is the surprising positive relationship between a wild dog habitat use and tiger rejecting the original hypothesis which they went which went which was basically proposed before they went into this research which is habitat exclusivity hypothesis this unexpected result gives you an understanding that all assumptions about antagonistic interactions and antagonistic species are much more complex than what we really think of them so before we go to the prims bite section three big topics we've done having both understanding of what we call as mains and prelims first we discussed the dia act 2023 which is the digital india act 2023 it replaces or it wants to replace the it act 2000 four major provisions four major provisions open internet safe internet guide emerging technologies last but not the least the concept of safe harbor principle being reviewed two major issues safe harbor principle if reviewed can lead to stifling of freedom of speech and guiding new emerging technologies can also stifle their development thereafter we went into the glacial lake outburst flood we already discussed this concept we went further two reasons either it was a cloud burst or techno tectonic activities earthquakes from the nepal sector impacted it how do we mitigate it early warning systems don't touch the fragile ecosystem last but not the least we discussed the wild dog dogs or the asiatic wild dog they went in with this hypothesis that the the reason why wild dogs are not surviving is because they have 
intersecting prey availability and habitats with tigers and other carnivores above their food chain ladder and that is interleading to their extinction but what they saw is a positive correlation if two of them exist together the coexistence is leading to habitat suitability going up which is something very interesting for you to understand and also tells you how nature is more complex than what we can think about it so there are three basic things i hope they are totally clear in your mind in that regard after this let's do one thing let's just look at the prims white section four very simple straight forward topics and we just have to remember them for prims perspective first is the indian air force has introduced a new ensign on its 91st anniversary just to show you this ensign the new addition is the indian air force insignia on the right hand corner this is very very important for you which is that it marked the 91st anniversary and now you have the air force crescent in the top right corner towards the flying side so it is on the top right corner they have added this new element which is important because this is movement away from the colonial concept itself and further this introduces a new type of dynamism when it comes to indian air force in that regard this parade which was done in prayagraj itself was very significant also because first the what we call as surya kiran the surya kiran whole concept itself or the sarang helicopter display as it is called in that for the first time from four we had five helicopters which is much much more difficult and last but not the least but the most important point is this is the first air force day parade which was commanded by a woman officer a female officer and captain shaliza dhami was the one who commanded this parade which becomes a first in the history of the indian air force she was also the first woman officer of the iaf to command a combat unit and the parade had an all women contingent from the newly inducted agni veer vayu personnel very very important this is why very 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 important she becomes a very important personality and this parade becomes important with the new ensign plus the fact that it had nari shakti in it it had women's power in it and it reflected that in that regard so that is a very important point you need to remember for the examination the 91st anniversary the one which i did on at prayagraj was the one which showed these new aspects and the new women's power in the indian air force and very important in today's context in that regard with this the isro has recently performed trajectory corrections for the aditya l1 and we know that it is moving towards the larange point just to refresh your memory about the larange point i am not taking l1 as a what we call as a given larange points are points at which the gravitational force of any two celestial bodies gets cancelled out so here it is about earth and the sun at larange points at l2 we already have the james webb telescope at l1 we want to have aditya l1 so that it can look towards the sun at all points of time and at larange point what happens is you don't need fuel to stay remain there because the gravitational force of the earth and the gravitational force of the sun gets cancelled out so it's basically an equilibrium point where it remains we were going off trajectory and therefore they had to move it to l1 so the last major orbital maneuver has been done L1 is close to 1.5 million kilo, kilometers away from the earth which is 1% distance from earth sun and that is important because the life of aditya will only be there if it is quite far away from the sun but also looking towards the sun at all points of time so we will get very soon very positive news about aditya l1 when it is in orbit at uh, or when it is at l1 or larange point 1 we already know that the vikram and pragyan rovers have not responded to any uh, what we call as incoming signals to be woken up so the uh, what we call as, as the polar polar night or the polar winter of the moon took the toll and the batteries went down and still with uh, at least 5 to 6 days of charging they have not woken up so in a way chandrayaan 3 project on the moon surface is over but we've achieved quite a lot in that regard then for some of you or for some of you who would be watching this video later board exams will now happen once if you want it and twice if you opt for it 
so the reason is being given is basically stress management so to reduce stress on the fact that 10th and 12th boards only happen once too much pressure on students they are talking about two attempts and the best one will be taken it's exact basically like how je neat or other, other examinations happen twice a year you will be able to give this examination that is the basic point should ease the stress on the school children you will always have a better chance to make your score better so in that regard makes sense last but not the least is a ferry service which is going to start between india and sri lanka so a much awaited high speed passenger ferry is going to develop or is being developed and is going to be inaugurated very soon between nagarapatnam and Kan uh, kankeshan thuri in sri lanka northern province itself the the boat the high speed craft which is called cheria pani is basically owned by the shipping corporation of india it will have a 14 member crew don't have to remember these things but it will it will be a very important sea route and sea connectivity between sri lanka northern sector and the the nagarapatnam port which is important this only leads to better soft power understanding and more connectivity between the people which is also good in that regard so before we go to the main questions seven topics new ensign the concept of a ferry between sri lanka and india thereafter board you can do twice aditya elvan these are things which will develop further also three major things dia act 2023 digital india act thereafter second most interesting one was the aspect related to positive correlation between two carnivores being in the same sector and last but not the least is the glacial lake outburst flood which was linked to moraine breach could be either flash flood uh, it could be either basically a cloud burst or tectonic activities shows more interesting aspects about the himalayan ecology the questions which i have given to you today reflect that that type of understanding also you see discuss how does the digital india act 2023 represent a significant step you can remove this s a significant step towards establishing a future ready legal framework for the country's digital ecosystem so what i've done is basically this is the way sometimes the questions are made from the newspaper they just picked up from the newspaper and added discuss how does and from this point forward they've quoted the article itself this type of questions also come try to attempt it second this is again quoting the newspaper the himalayan ecosystem is the most fragile in the world and any disruption in a way we are managing these resources will have problematic outcome for the people of this region comment again very realistic question these are how these are questions which are made out of the newspaper this is a very interesting line you have to show that sikkim uttarakhand himachal pradesh all show how these ecosystems are getting disrupted and are problematic in the long run so with this i would like to end the session thank you so much i will see you tomorrow that is again tomorrow cn is assigned to me thank you take care bye bye and have a very productive day take care